reported in the media here was that over the past 18 years, eight, eight years, some 14,000 Ukrainians were killed in the fighting, and you didn't hear about that. So uh, the war had been going on for all these years. We we lived in uh, Kiev for all of that time, and. We were just going about business as usual, even though there was the buildup of Russian troops in the north and on the east borders. But this was not something that was of particular concern to us. So we were quite surprised when at four o'clock in the morning, there were explosions that rattled the windows of our house and uh, the war had begun. And through a a series of amazing things. The Lord brought us out of Ukraine safely. Uh, what would normally take six to seven hours uh, of driving uh, it took us about 48 hours uh, to get out by the time we put everything together and all the travels and taking back roads and various things. If you want the details of all of this, uh, you can go to the website for uh, deanbibleministries.org and uh, click on the recent Chafer conference. And there, Robbie Dean and I spend about an hour giving all of the details about our coming out. But I want you to know that uh, God answers prayer. And there were many, many people who got on the prayer line. And they, heard, of course, saw on the news here that the war had started in Ukraine. Uh, many people knew that Robbie Dean was there at the time, and Phyllis and I were there. And, uh, boy, the Internet was just burning up uh, with people sending out text messages and uh, requesting prayer. And we know that we were... Uh, delivered by the grace of God, the mercy of God, and I want to thank all of you who have been praying for us, and I want to urge you to continue to pray for the people of Ukraine. I pray that God will uh, destroy that enemy. I pray that there will be victory in Ukraine, that once again there might be peace in that land, and uh, we might be able to return. Uh, to continue the work that we've done there. What has happened, uh, and you can hear a lot of conflicting things. If you get on the internet, you can read a lot of uh, bad things, incorrect things, fake news, if you will, about Ukrainians. And I've had people write to me, well, what's this we hear? The Ukrainians are really corrupt, and so we shouldn't help them. Oh. Unlike America, <laughs> you don't have any corrupt politicians in this nation, do you? So would you want someone to say, well, America's in trouble, we're not going to help her because you have corruption? I don't think so. But also, I uh, get these emails about people who say, ah, uh, Ukrainians are anti-Semitic. And so... Uh, we should offer not one bit of help to Ukraine because there are anti-Semites in Ukraine. Do we have any here? Oh, I think so. We have evil people everywhere. I mean, the problem is that you all have a sin nature. And so does everyone in Ukraine. So does everyone in Russia. Um, and it's not everyone who is uh, exhibiting anti-Semitism. I have uh, lived in Ukraine for 26 years now. Uh, Jews live there. Is there anti-Semitism? Some. No question about it, just like you have it here. Uh, but Jews live in relative peace in Ukraine. And uh, if you hear about the city of Odessa, You've got one right close to here named Odessa, don't you? They've got one. It's in the very south of Ukraine, very important city. It's on the Black Sea. 
It's the last open seaport that Ukraine has on the Black Sea. Russia wants to take that because that will make Ukraine a landlocked country. And right now, all of the imports coming by sea are coming in through the city of Odessa. Odessa has about 40,000 Jews. The president of Ukraine is a Jew. So don't, uh, I, I get irritated when people start saying, we should not support Ukraine because a few people are anti-Semitic. Uh, and then you have this other thing, which is just absolutely ludicrous about Nazis or neo-Nazis. I don't know if you've seen that on the news or on the internet. I want to tell you this is just pure nonsense. What has happened is that Germany fought against Russia, the Soviet Union during World War II, and the Germans did horrible, horrible things in Russia and in Ukraine in World War II. And so if you just use the word Nazi, immediately it raises very negative feelings, hatred among the people in Russia and in Ukraine. And at the beginning of this current uh, conflict, Putin said, we want to denazify Ukraine. He's saying there are a lot of Nazis in Ukraine. No, there's not. We've been there for a quarter of a century. I've not seen any Nazis. And the people in Ukraine, they hate Nazis so much from World War II that they're not going to tolerate Nazis. But now you have people here in America who are talking about uh, Nazis in Ukraine, and therefore we should support them. I just want to tell you this is fake news, nonsense. Now, the Russians invaded Ukraine unprovoked. They had no basis for it, except you have a leader in Russia who decided that he wanted to take land in Ukraine. He wanted to control the government in Ukraine. And so he's taking steps to bring that about. He's uh, suffered a lot of losses to achieve whatever it is he wants to achieve. He hasn't gotten it yet. But the attack by Russia was unprovoked. And Ukraine has every right to defend itself. And I am very proud of the people of Ukraine they have shown great courage, and they are just valiant warriors, and they are fighting for their lives. They are fighting for their wives, for their sisters, for their daughters. They're fighting for their freedom, and I think that it's altogether fitting that we pray for you. And what the Russians have done already in Ukraine, you've seen some of it on the news. Uh, they are just trying to devastate the country. They are trying to destroy the will of the people to resist. And so much of what they have done is aimed at civilians. It has nothing to do with military objectives. They have gone in uh, to residential areas and just bombed and bombed and bombed. And in some places, it's just block after block after block that now is nothing but rubble. And there's no justification for this. In addition to that, you may have heard some horror stories about things that have happened in some of the areas that the Russians had occupied, but uh, where they have now been uh, driven out. Cities like Irpin, Bucha, if these are names that are familiar to you. And the Russians uh, have raped and pillaged. And it's just been absolutely horrible. And uh, they, they found civilians and what they've done to them, uh, the torture and other things is just absolutely brutal. But this is not something new. This is a pattern that the Russian military has followed. Uh, if you remember, there was a war in Chechnya a few years ago where Russia invaded Chechnya. They did the same thing there. The 
you recall, Russia also invaded the country of Georgia uh, back 10, 12 years ago. They went into Georgia, and it was the same thing there. I talked to the ambassador to Ukraine, who had been the ambassador in Georgia uh, when the Russians invaded, and he said what the Russians did after they uh, took over the country, when they began to leave, it was just rape and pillage. He said it was just absolutely horrible, and none of it got reported in the Western press. So what, what they are doing is what they have been doing. And uh, the Ukrainian people are standing up. They are not going to give in. Uh, if you see things about the city of Mariupol, which is a port city down on the Black Sea, uh, and they have been bombing that city for some 56 days now. And there's virtually nothing left of the city except one large steel mill, which is the largest in all of Europe, huge. And there are thousands of people in that steel uh, complex now. Uh, many of them civilians have gone there to try to find safety. Uh, and that is now completely surrounded. <laughs> And it's like the Alamo. And those people, those Ukrainians who were in there said, we will not give up. And the whole world is going to stand by and they are going to watch the Alamo that's taking place there in Ukraine. And I said, it's just horrible. Pray, please, for Ukraine. Pray for the Ukrainians. Pray that God will bring peace to that land once again. But I want to say this also about the war. God is the sovereign. God is in control of history. He could have prevented this whole thing from happening. He did not. He has his own purposes in it. And we may not understand those purposes, but I can tell you that God is using this conflict to spread the gospel to bring many people to faith in Christ. People from our church, people from the Bible college, people that have gone out from us, from our ministry, they are scattered around the country of Ukraine, and they are using this as an intensified opportunity for evangelism. Because now people are in fear of their lives. People have lost everything because their home has been bombed, and now they have nothing, absolutely nothing but the clothes on their back. And these people are desperate. And we have people who are ministering to them, showing them compassion, and helping them, but also giving them the greatest good news that anyone could ever hear. They're hearing that there's salvation. They're hearing about eternal life. They're hearing that they do not have to fear physical death. And people are being saved, and people are being ministered to all around the country of Ukraine. Not only that, but many of our people have fled uh, to other countries in Europe, and they're being evangelists there. They are being Bible teachers there. We have men who are now ministering to Ukrainian refugees in other countries. We have people who are evangelizing in other countries. And I still continue to meet twice a week with, with our church uh, from Kiev. And these people are not complaining. They are not whining. Oh, I've lost everything. Oh, poor me. Or why did God let this happen to me? Or th th We don't hear any of that. Instead, they are praising God for his grace, for his mercy. And they are using today as an intensified opportunity serve the Lord. Pray for these people that God is going to be glorified in all of this. And so he can take all things and make them work together for good in his plan. So I just thank you for those who have prayed. I want to encourage you to continue to pray for our Ukrainian loved ones, Pray for the military in Ukraine and just pray that uh, God would soon bring an end to this conflict. Phyllis and I have a desire to go back 
as soon as possible. And, uh, that, that's where our home is. That's where our heart is. And we want to go back and continue to minister to those people in that place. Now, we are in America. America's in great trouble. America is under judgment today. It's not that judgment is going to come. Judgment has already begun. It's already here. But in many cases, we, we're just unaware. We're so self-absorbed that we don't recognize that what is happening in this nation is judgment from God. And if the people of God don't return to God, the word of God, if they don't have a spiritual life of their own, the judgment is going to intensify. I would invite you to open your Bibles with me tonight, first of all, to Leviticus chapter 26. In Leviticus chapter 26, now this is parallel also to Deuteronomy chapter 28. I would encourage you to read these two chapters uh, in their entirety tonight when you get home or tomorrow. Leviticus chapter 26 is important because it defines actually the rest of the Old Testament and what happens with Israel. Everything that happens to Israel is prophesied in this chapter. Now what we have in, in the beginning of this chapter, we have promises of blessing. In verse 3, God says, If you walk in my statutes, keep my commandments and perform them, then I will give you rain in its season. The land will yield its produce. The trees of the field shall yield their fruit. Your threshing shall last till the time of vintage. The vintage shall last till the time of sowing. You'll eat your bread to the full and dwell in your land safely. Here is God saying, listen, if you will keep my word, there's going to be blessing. There's going to be peace. There's going to be prosperity. But God also promises that if you do not obey my word, I am going to bring judgment upon the nation. The judgment comes because of disobedience. And so we have this judgment for disobedience to the word of God. And in Leviticus chapter 26, we find five cycles of judgment. And they are introduced by a phrase that indicates disobedience on the part of Israel. And as the nation accumulates disobedience and rejects the word of God, then the judgment increases. And this is something that's illustrated by the ministries of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, and so on. And people bring discipline upon themselves through the rejection of the word and failure to be obedient to it. So I, I want us quickly to look at these cycles of discipline. First of all, let's go down to verse 14. Here he says, if you do not obey me and do not observe all these commandments, if you despise my statutes or if your soul abhors my judgment so that you do not perform all my commandments but break my covenant, this is what I'll do to you. So now we're going to see discipline, judgment from the Lord, national. Now the first cycle of discipline described in verses 14 through 17, okay, he says in verse 16, I will do this to you. I will even appoint terror over you, wasting disease and fever, which shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart. Sow your seed in vain for your enemy shall eat it. Now what we see here is that we have terror or fear, there is disease, and then stolen crops. You're, you're going to plant 
but your enemies are going to eat the crops. This is equivalent to the economy. They had an agrarian economy. And so uh, when, when you do the work and somebody else eats your labor, you see, that's what we have going on today. And we see these things happening in America. People living in fear. How do I know they live in fear? I'm driving down the road. There's a man next to me, all alone in his car, got a mask over his face. <laughs> Saw a man riding a bicycle out in the middle of nowhere, got a mask on his face. Why? People are living in fear. People are living in fear. I'm walking around the neighborhood where we're staying in Houston. I see people, they have bars on the window. They have bars uh, over their carport. People are living in their own prisons. Why? Because they're afraid of what might come in. And this is something that is increasing. All right, second cycle of discipline in verses 18 through 20. Um, Oh, I didn't read the rest of that. Uh, in verse 17, this first cycle, I will set my face against you. You'll be defeated by your enemies. Those who hate you shall reign over you. Oh, hello. Those who hate you will reign over you. Did that apply to us? You shall flee when no one pursues you. Now, verse 18, after all of this, that is, after God brings this kind of judgment, if you do not obey me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. Now, seven times more, he's saying, I'm going to intensify the judgment. I will break the pride of your power. I will make your heavens like bronze, your earth like iron, your heavens like iron, earth like bronze, and your strength will be spent in vain. For your land will not yield its produce, nor the trees of the land yield their fruit. What we have here, the economy is destroyed. That's the pride of your power being broken. The economy is destroyed. What's happening in our nation today? We're in serious trouble economically. The national debt. And then they have drought, heavens like iron, earth like bronze, but the earth is hard it's because there's been a drought. And then there's bad harvest. So people work hard, but they don't get anything for their labor. No good results from their labor, so you can work and work and you still can't make hands meet. The third cycle. In verses 21 and 22, verse 21, Then if you walk contrary to me, are not willing to obey me, I will bring on you seven times more plagues according to your sins. So there's going to be an intensification of the judgment. I will send wild beasts among you, which shall rob you of your children, destroy your livestock, make you few in number, and your highways will be now, what we have here, again, people don't respond to the word of God. That's why God intensifies the judgment. So things get bad, and this is designed by God to get people to say, hey, we need to go back to the spiritual life. We need to return to God. We need to come back to biblical principles. But if they don't, then God will... Uh, turn up the heat, things will get worse. So you have plagues, and uh, this indicates something that's painful, either from disease or as a result of being struck, beaten, or whipped. And then violence, pictured by wild beasts here, but it indicates a violence in the land that is so severe that the population is actually reduced and there's a loss of personal wealth, and people fear to go outside. Do we have that? Well, you look at the murder rate in Houston. 
which is almost equal to what it is in Chicago. Every night you turn on the news and you see there's a, been a, a horrible attack. Subways in New York, or it can be a mass shooting in a mall, or maybe even in a church. And this is getting worse and worse, and this is judgment on our nation. That's the wild beasts among you. We have them. Now the fourth cycle in verses 23 to 26. If by these things you are not reformed by me, but walk contrary to me, I will punish you yet seven times for your sins, and I will bring a sword against you that will execute the vengeance of the covenant. When you are gathered together within your cities, I will send pestilence among you, and you shall be delivered into the hand of the enemy. When I have cut off the supply of your bread, ten women shall break your bread, bake your bread in one oven. They shall bring back your bread by weight, and you shall eat and not be satisfied. So here we have the sword, and this is speaking about the fact that you are going to be invaded. Foreigners are going to come in to the land. And then there's going to be flight. People are going to start gathering in the cities. They are going to seek shelter. And then comes disease as a result of people being crowded together in the cities. And then there will be rationing. It will come. They deliver your bread by weight. That's food rationing. And the result's going to be great hunger. So again, there's economic disaster. And then the fifth cycle of discipline found in verses 27 through 46. Uh, but again, this comes because of a failure to return to the Lord. And what we see in this, we won't take the time to read all of it, but you have cannibalism. He says, you'll eat the flesh of your sons and the flesh of your daughters. There will be cities destroyed. The places of worship will be destroyed. There's going to be an utter desolation of the land, and people will be driven out of the land and dispersed among the nations. Now, you can see how this has worked out in the history of Israel. You read the rest of the Old Testament, and you can see when Israel was Following the word of God, when they were obedient to the Lord, they had incredible prosperity. And they had peace in the land. But when they began to turn away from God, then God began to bring the judgment, which was designed to bring people back to the Lord so that they would obey the word. But if they did not, then God increased the judgment. And he increased the judgment. And he increased the judgment until the land was taken over by foreigners. And then, then if the people still did not respond to the word of God, God destroyed the nation. So you can see the northern kingdom of Israel destroyed by the Assyrians. They were taken out of the land, removed completely from the land. The southern kingdom continued for uh, a number of years, but they too ultimately were destroyed as a nation. They were taken to Babylon as captives. The nation was destroyed. But God was merciful, and after 70 years, the Babylonian captivity was ended. People were permitted to return to the land, and uh, once again, the, uh, the people were back in the land. But you can see this over and over again. So the people had another opportunity. Messiah came. The people rejected him. And today, Israel has been destroyed. Uh, they have been scattered all over the face of the earth. And I know there's a, a nation called Israel today, but I want you to understand there are as many Jews living around the world as there are living in Israel today. Uh, one day, God is going to restore his people. But understand that they today are living under the curse of that's found right here. You can read a parallel passage also in Deuteronomy chapter 28, chapter 29. When you get to Deuteronomy chapter 30, 
then you see God still has a plan for his people and he's going to restore them ultimately to the land and he is uh, not finished with them by any means. God had made promises to them. He would keep those promises. But what I want you to see from this, now these five cycles, they don't apply to us. This was given to Israel. We have no promise that if we're destroyed, God will ultimately bring us back. That is, however, promised to Israel. But what you can see here is that when people turn away from the word of God, that God is going to bring judgment, judgment to the nation. And we, I believe, are being judged by God today as we can see many of these factors being played out in our nation today. So how does God judge a nation? Bad economy, economic failure, disease, famine, Invasion by foreigners. Do we have that in Texas? Violence. Allowing people to express their sin natures without restraint. One of the ways that God judges people is to let them be sinful without stopping them. And you read Romans chapter 1 where it talks about the homosexuality and the perversion. How did that happen? God lets people do it. Rather than putting up a restraint. Do we see that today? What's being taught to our kindergarten children? First, second, third graders. I mean, all of this perverted teaching about sexuality. And who knows what a woman is? Or nobody knows really what sex they are. People are being taught this today. It's an abomination to the Lord. And that's judgment from God that this is just spreading throughout our land. God is allowing this to happen. Why? Because the people of God are not living according to the word of God. I, I lay much of the blame for our current situation on the church, on the people of God. Because in churches today, people are just fat, dumb, and happy. They want to sit and soak. They don't want to have a personal spiritual life. In so many churches, the church has become a venue for entertainment. Everything takes place on the platform. And it's just a show. And people come because it makes them feel good. Oh, when I leave, I just feel so good but it has no impact on their daily life when they go to work on Monday. They live just like the world. Their norms and standards are worldly norms and standards. People don't have this personal walk with the Lord. So we need to, to understand what the Word of God has to say and we want to see how can we make a difference in the world. In 2 Timothy 3, 5, well, we'll start in verse 4, 2 Timothy 3, 4. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. They don't want Bible teaching. I know that's not this church. And I know that there are churches that are there that are, are true to the word of God. And I thank God for them. But by and large, throughout the churches in America today, they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power of godliness. It's a, spec a spectacle. According to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. People don't want Bible teaching anymore. Many churches, the body only meets on Sunday morning. The whole thing is one hour. 
and precious little of that one hour is devoted to the Word of God. You might have 45 minutes of music, and much of the music is just nonsense. It's entertainment. In 1 Samuel chapter 12, Verse 14, if you fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and do not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then both you and the king who reigns over you will continue following the Lord your God. Now, what this verse is saying is you get the government that you deserve. If you have godly people, then you are going to have good leadership. If you have ungodly people, you're going to have bad leadership. Well, people say, oh, they complain about our government. You have no right to complain about your government. None. What are we doing? If you could choose who you would put in the White House, if you could choose all of the members of the Congress. You know what it would change in this country? Nothing. Not a thing. Why? Because we are an evil people. See, we want the government to change things. It doesn't work that way. We're, we're looking for political solutions. I hear this all across the country. People want to change the government. That's not the solution. The solution is going to be spiritual. You know the verse in 2 Chronicles 7, 14. Another verse that is written to Israel and uh, does not directly apply to the United States. But you know the verse. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now, the United States is not the people of God. We, the church, are the people of God. But we don't have a promise that God will heal our land. But still, we have this principle. If people will humble themselves and pray, what do we pray about? We're going to talk about that uh, tomorrow. How do we pray? About what do we pray? How can it make a difference? What kind of prayers should we offer? Often our prayers are so superficial. Often our prayers are so concerned with just menial, temporal things, and we ignore the weightier matters. We ignore spiritual realities. And we're looking for temporal solutions. Rather than looking at things from the divine perspective. But here he says, pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. Do we have any wicked ways in the church, people? I speak as a fool. Yes, we do. We have many people. They may be saved and on their way to heaven. But the Word of God has no impact in their life, no real impact. They don't have the spiritual values. They don't have the understanding of the God who is, the God who is the sovereign. And they're not seeking to serve him, they're not seeking to please him, not seeking to glorify him, and there's the problem. In Proverbs 14, 34, it says, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Now this applies to us. 
when you have the believers in the land who are righteous, not just imputed righteousness, but they have a, a righteous conduct. This exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. We are a sinful people, and we deserve judgment. Sometimes I get asked, do you find America anywhere in the Bible? Well, not by name, but certainly we can find a number of passages that apply to us today. For example, Jeremiah chapter 18. This is where you have that well-known story about the potter who was able to make a vessel and uh, the clay gets ruined in his hands, and so he just smashes it down and, and makes something different. In Jeremiah 18, 7, God says, The instant that I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up, to pull down, and to destroy it, if that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will repent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. We're here. The United States still exists today. So I believe it's not too late. It says, if it will, re it will turn from the evil, then I will relent of the disaster I thought to bring upon it. Verse 9, and the instant... Verse 9, the instant I speak concerning a nation, concerning a kingdom, to build it and to plant it, if it does evil in my sight, so that it does not obey my voice, then I will relent concerning the good with which I said I would benefit it. So here we see that God says, I will bless or I will curse. In Daniel chapter 4, you have that account of Nebuchadnezzar where uh, God judged him and made him like an animal. And then when he was restored, he said, The Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. And that statement is found three times in that chapter. The exact same statement, the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, and he gives it to whomever he chooses. In Daniel chapter 2, verses 20 and 21, Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his, and he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings, and he raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise, and knowledge to those who have understanding. Question, is God sovereign? Yes. Ah. Does he have control of history? Does he raise up rulers and bring down rulers? Yes. Could God have changed the outcome of the election in the year 2000? Could God have done that? Ah. God gives us rulers according to the people of the nation. Why should we complain about our leaders? Who put that man in the office? He 
he allowed that man to rise to power. Why? God has a purpose for that. But people are complaining. Oh, let's wait until a midterm. Oh, let's wait until 2024, and then we'll put a good man in there, and all our problems will be solved. And I'm telling you that's wrong. It has to do with spirituality. It has to do with the attitude of people toward the Word of God. Where are the people of God? What should we be doing as God's children? Right here, right now, at this time, how are we to be living? What should we be thinking? <clears throat> we need to have answers that come from the Word of God. But I just hear, oh, political this, and uh, you know, I, all human viewpoint solutions. Changing the leadership is not going to change the people. And if we don't change the people, if our hearts are not attuned to the plan of God, then judgment is going to increase. 1 Timothy 2.1 Paul says, I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Paul is saying, you know what we need? We need prayer. He lists different categories of prayer. Supplication, prayers, intercession, giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority. Why? So that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. We need to have godliness and reverence. But we need to be in prayer. Well, how do we pray for them? Are you praying for our president? What kind of prayers are you praying? Drop dead president? What are you asking God to do for that man or in that man's life? Or for all who are in authority? What about the vice president? What about the governors? What about the congressmen? What about the senators? Are you praying for these men? And what are you asking God to do with regard to these men? We need to have an understanding of how God wants to use us to have an impact in the nation and how to pray. There is one of the greatest examples, perhaps the greatest in all of the Bible, about praying for a nation is found in Daniel chapter 9. So let's go to Daniel chapter 9. Now Daniel 9 is well known because of the great prophecy of the 70 weeks and all, and that's where we focus all of our attention. But Daniel 9 is just an amazing chapter. <clears throat> Daniel was reading the book of Jeremiah. He understood from the word of God that the captivity in Babylon was about to come to an end. But he also recognized from the word of God that God is not going to uh, to restore the nation until the people humble themselves. Daniel, a man about whom nothing negative is said in all of the word of God. A most incredible testimony. There's nothing negative about Daniel. Great man of God. But look at how he prays in this chapter. Daniel 9.3. Then I set my face toward the Lord God to make request by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. He's serious about his prayers. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O oh Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him, and with those who keep his commandments, there's a lot here 
that we could study about prayer, uh, we see that Daniel recognizes the greatness of God. He recognizes the character of God. Who is this God to whom we pray? We need to understand God's attributes, and we need to address those attributes in our prayers. At least when we come to him with requests, you ask God to do something. Is he the sovereign? Yes. And that means he's in control of things. He can do what he wants to do. But God is also omniscient. He knows all things. He knows what's good. He knows what's not good. He knows where things are going. And so God, when we pray to him, he's got all the facts, and I may not have all of the facts. And so God has a plan that's based upon his knowing all things. But also God is omnipotent. And that means God can do what God wants to do. God can do what God has promised to do because he has the power to do it. And so I come to God and I ask him to do something. It's a recognition that he is almighty. Also, God is absolute truth. Or he is, he is called in Titus 1-2, the non lying God. God who cannot lie has given us exceedingly great and precious promises. I need to know what are those promises because God can't lie and I need to come to him. Lord, you said. He keeps covenant and mercy with those who love him. What is mercy? God has a desire to help us. And he has the ability to do so. So he comes and he, he addresses God and he acknowledges his greatness and his glory. Now, verse 5, we have sinned and committed iniquity. Who is we? Daniel includes himself. He's talking about the nation. We have sinned and committed iniquity. And Daniel He's not guilty of all of those sins of idolatry and all of the other things that brought about the destruction of the nation. He wasn't involved in that, and yet he said, we, when we come before God and pray for this nation, we need to say, we, we deserve this judgment because we are a part of it. And recognize that if God is going to produce deliverance, it's not just for us, it's going to be for the people. We have done wickedly. We have rebelled even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. That's where we are as a people. Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes, to our fathers and all the people of the land. We didn't listen to the word. Oh, Lord, righteousness belongs to you. But to us, shame of face, as it is this day, to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and all Israel, those near, those far off, and all the countries to which you have driven them because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. O oh Lord, to us belong shame of face, to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, because we have sinned against you. Verse 9, to the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, even though we have rebelled against him. It's a great prayer of Daniel praying for his nation. He wants the restoration of his people. But he has humbled himself. So we can blame bad people. We can blame evil people for all of the bad things going on in America. And then that's us. We're a part of that. And what are we doing now understand, God has a purpose for you right now, today, right where you are. God knew where you would be today. 
And he put you in this situation for his purposes. You are not here for you. We need to get over ourselves. It's not all about me. And I know that's very difficult for some people to really take in or to admit, but it's not about you. It's about God. We are his people. We are here for his purposes. And we need to understand what is his purpose for us. And if we can come and really get a grasp of God's purpose for us, it's going to change the way that you look at the world. It's going to change your attitude. And we recognize that we are here. God wants to use us. And if I do that, then under any circumstance, no matter whether it's good, no matter whether it's bad, I can know that my life is significant, it makes a difference, and I'm not going to be just focused on my own needs. But I'm going to be focused on glorifying the Lord. So what we will do in the morning is we're going to talk about prayer. You all know that. I'm sure you've heard that. But the doctrine of prayer never went to the throne of grace. You can have 15 points on praying properly. Then take it to the throne of grace. We need to come to that throne of grace. We need to come with confidence that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Do you want mercy? Of course. Do you want grace to help in time of need? Of course. But you've got to come to the throne of mercy, and it's not one of these quickie prayers, oh, God, help. So tomorrow, we're going to look at some principles about prayer. And we're going to talk about how we can put these things into practice in a way that will make a difference. We need to be people who are serious about prayer. Peter said, 1 Peter 4, 7, be serious in your prayers. Are you serious? Or do you have a few memorized prayers and that's what you get every day? What are we praying for? How are we praying? So I want to talk about getting serious about our prayers. And if we do that, I really believe it will transform your life, transform your marriage, your church, this community. It will make a difference. Just been reading a book. It's about <clears throat> revival in America going back to the late 1700s. And what was going on also in, in Great Britain late 1700s, early 1800s. Now there was a tremendous revival. Something was called the Great Awakening in America, or the Second Great Awakening. You know how it started? It was prayer. Prayer groups. There was a man in New York City who said, he put an ad in the paper, we're going to have a prayer meeting. We want all of the men to come and we're going to start praying for New York. We're going to start praying for America. We're going to start praying for revival. Big advertisement. So you had a city of several million people. Eight people showed up. Only eight. praying, and this, this thing just spread and spread, and it caused a great revival. Hundreds of thousands of people got saved in the next 20, 30 years. 
God has something for you. Uh, maybe we're just preparing the remnant. Maybe that this nation is going to come under really severe judgment. But even if that happens, God has a purpose for you. And you can glorify the Lord as the remnant. But it may be that God will use you as the catalyst to bring about a revival. Why not? Do you believe that? Could it happen? We're still here. It could still happen. Do you trust God? I hope you come back in the morning, first hour here. Okay. We'll, we'll continue to. Heavenly Father, I thank you that we can come to you with great confidence, not because we deserve to be heard, but because we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. He's at your right hand, and because of him, we can come with confidence to the throne of grace. So I pray, Father, we will learn to enter into the true holy of holies in heaven. That we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I pray that the Holy Spirit will take your word and convict us by it. Cause us to see the things that we need to change in our attitude and our actions so as to fulfill your purpose for us in this place at this time. So I thank you for this time we've had to fellowship together, but especially to fellowship with you through the word. May it bear fruit in our lives so that the Lord Jesus Christ might be exalted. You're going to be glorified through it. And I ask this in Jesus' name.